So I logged into the servers and everything was still alive, so I took a backup and copied everything off and started trying to find what's actually going on. So uh, while trying to get uh, all of the information about what, what's, uh, what was going on, uh, I f find some legal advice. I got a lawyer for us and, you know, I'm trying to um, just keep everything cool and organized. We started Pirate Bay in 2003. It started on a shared server in Mexico uh, where my colleague Gottfried worked. And uh, it developed so that uh, the internet connection of that company became so uh, highly utilized that we had to move it to Sweden. And then we just kept growing and growing. There, there was obviously a demand for a stable Swedish tracker. So, so well, I wasn't involved from the very beginning, but, well, they needed some place to ho host it. And, well, that's, that's when I first came into the picture. Uh, back, back then, I, I didn't even know how BitTorrent worked. I had, had someone explain it for me, and, okay, we'll do that. So, so I hooked them up with, uh, with WebSpace on my server, which was uh, then hosted in the basement of of the place I worked worked at then, and so I also got after a while I also got got involved in the set set up and the maintenance of the site. I mean, the Pirate Bay. I don't really know how they work because they are they don't say very much to us all the time, but they, they seem to work a bit like a, like a rock band. I've been a great admirer of uh, particularly the Pirate Bureau's work and even the Pirate Bay's work for several years. We have about a good approximation, it's about one to two million unique visitors per day. Uh, running a BitTorrent uh, indexing site like uh, the Pirate Bay uh, wasn't or isn't directly unlawful under Swedish law or under, I mean, like most copyright laws, because it's not about uh, direct involvement in, in transactions of copyrighted material, but only transactions of metadata, basically, links and file names and checksums and so on. But we were always ready for a, for a raid or some of some kind, so we basically just we had a some sort of knowledge to how we would should react, and that's basically what, what I did. Rapport kan ikväll avslöja att Rassian är ett resultat av ett politiskt spel på högsta politiska nivå mellan regeringarna i Rosenbad och Vita Hus. The worldwide motion picture industry lost $18.2 billion to piracy in 2005. Internet piracy alone cost the industry $7.1 billion. The people running America's movie studios know that if they don't do something, and fast, 
they could be in the same boat as the record companies. What's really at stake for the movie industry with all this piracy? Well, I think, you know, ultimately our absolute future. So Peter Chernin runs 20th Century Fox, one of the biggest studios in Hollywood. Somebody can put a perfect digital copy up on the internet, perfect digital copy, right? And with the click of a mouse, send out a million copies all over the world in an instant. And it's all free. If that takes hold, what kiss Hollywood goodbye. Way? I got a, got a phone call from, from someone, someone at my Volatile company that we shared office space with that uh, there, was a, there was a lot of, a lot of poli policemen there. And they asked, what the fuck? What, uh, I mean, we, we have like one or two requests a year that, that they want us to, for example, give out the details to a specific customer. So I was like, okay. So, so I went there with a cab and the police actually stopped the cab with lights flashing and all. Jackie and I are on a mission to stop piracy. If this were a movie, we could take on the bad guys ourselves. But this is the real world. We need your help. When you buy pirate movie and music, you support criminals. Now these criminals are counterfeiting other things, like electronics and medicine. Take action. Demand the real thing. Help us stop piracy. Let's terminate it. There were already police officers present uh, and they wanted to know who I was and I kept asking, who are you? And they, who are you? Because they didn't identify themselves as police officers and after a bit of uh, who are you in, uh, they finally, yeah we're police officers, we're here on an investigation. They first asked us some stuff about the BitTorrent protocol. Then they asked some stuff about the Pirate Bay and my involvement in it. All servers from all our server rooms were taken. In total, somewhere around 250, 300 servers. Where the Pirate Bay is about 20 of those servers. So all the time I spent there, they only asked me questions about 25 minutes. And it's most, mostly, how does BitTorrent work? Do you know what the Pirate Bay is? Do you operate the Pirate Bay? I think the, the prosecutor had I just written up this, this little little script for them to follow. Pirates being Sweden got raided uh, for some reason, but I'm not sure. I'm not really that much uh, into it. Well, the American lobby organizations told Swedish police basically to do it, to raid them and to close them down. So the big companies told them to do that. Viktiga filmintressena i Hollywood har skickat sin intresseorganisation MPAA till Vita huset i Washington. Amerikanska utrikesdepartementet har sedan tagit kontakt med UD i Sverige och krävt att problemet med Pirate Bay måste lösas. They think that uh, the US jurisdiction stretches around the world that yeah it's illegal according to US law but it's not illegal according to Swedish law and the US really appreciated that we yeah, talk back to them. Tell them that you don't decide over the internet. We, the users, do. En och en halv månad sedan åkte en delegation med företrädare för Rikspolisstyrelsen, Rikskriminalpolisen och Justitiedepartementet över till USA för att höra vad USA krävde. Amerikanska myndigheter lät då den svenska delegationen förstå hur problemet med Pirate Bay borde lösas. När delegationen var hemma igen hamnade frågan på högsta politiska nivå hos justitieminister Thomas Bodström som signalerade att något måste göras. Polis och åklagare svarade då regeringen att rättsläget är oklart. Man hade inte nog på fötterna för att agera mot Pirate Bay. Just den frågan hade en åklagare redan uträtt. Men regeringen var inte nöjd med svaret. Justitieministerns statssekreterare kontaktade då riksåklagaren och rikspolischefen som i sin tur beordrade åklagare och polis att agera. When the responsible prosecutor was called up to the department in Stockholm uh, the spring 2006 and he have been telling that this to the Swedish national television later on that uh, there was mentioned a threat of WTO sanctions against Sweden. And in the first hand, maybe you about U.S. putting Sweden on the, this this thing called the priority watch list. Ja, det kan man läsa ut brev som Elias som fick i mars. Här bekräftas också att USA pressat på.
Brevet skickades av John Malcolm på Hollywoods mäktiga lobbyorganisation MPA. Han påminner om deras möte i höstas. Vi diskuterade ingående organisationen Pirate Bay verksam i Sverige. Som ni säkert vet har den amerikanska ambassaden enträget bett Sveriges regering att agera mot Pirate Bay. Jag vill återigen uppmana er att utöva ett inflytande för att få de rättsvårdande myndigheterna i Sverige. So it really got to a high level. The Minister of Justice were accused of committing crimes in the raid. Because it's illegal for a minister in Sweden to tell the police exactly what they should do. Där statssekreterare Dan Eliasson uppgifterna om att Sverige utsatts för hot om handelssanktioner. Jag vet att USA har synpunkter på effektiviteten i vårt system när det gäller upphovsrätt. Och att om inte Sverige och andra länder följer sina internationella åtaganden så finns det sanktionsmekanismer i USA. Det vet jag och det har påtalats från amerikansk sida. Det här har framförts. Jag vet att det har förekommit diskussioner om att om internationella regelverket när det gäller handel och upphovsrätt inte följs av Sverige och andra länder, då finns det en sanktionsmekanism. Tycker du att det ingår i dina arbetsuppgifter att, rap- att rapportera till en lobbyist från Hollywood? Jag rapporterar inte till någon dom. Jag tror att det är en på den svenska lagen. Directly after the raid, the MPAA sent out a press release saying basically um, mission succeeded. And uh, that also shows very clear, I think, that the mission was not convicting people. It was sabotaging. Yeah, but uh, online again after a few days. Nobody thought we were actually going back online and that was like the biggest question. Are you actually coming back online? And I was very clear that we are coming back online if you stop calling me. <laughs> the obvious goal of the goal of the police was to uh, get the Pirate Bay offline and get the, the internet supplier PRQ offline. But they failed miserably. After three days, the servers were back up and uh, most of the backups restored. So the uh, site worked perfectly. And uh, about a week after that, Everything was back up 100%. It's spectacular success for us. <laughs> When the raid happened, we got an enormous amount of media attention. So it definitely helped. Uh, the days after the raid, we had uh, doubled our visitor numbers. And uh, also it uh, awakened the debate about file sharing in Sweden. I mean, most, most people in Sweden feel, feel pissed about the use of, inter- of uh, trade sanction threats to override national law. Yeah, a lot of different uh, youth groups to the parties uh, were active in our demonstration to show the support for the file sharing in Sweden. I think we had four different parties attending uh, the demonstration and also three of them were speaking uh, on behalf of their party at the demonstration uh, along with representative of uh, the piracy bureau and the Pirate Bay, and also the newly formed Pirate Party also got a lot, they doubled their members, member numbers in two days. Everyone in Sweden somehow knows about the Pirate Bay today. Uh, Pirate Bay bush torrents, uh, and I also use uh, DC. It's from the Pirate Bay mostly, but then it's the Minenova. Uh, I use Pirate Bay, uh, a place called Karagarga. The Pirate Bay and Internet. I have gotten a lot of support from the rest of the ISP community and a lot of new customers calling us up and saying Hey, we heard about the raid. We want to help you. We want to move our cool location to your place. Because they know that we stand for uh, freedom of speech and we would like to defend it. Väljarna opinionsundersökningar visar att en majoritet av dem tycker att den här lagen mot fildelning är dum. De betraktar det som en allemansrätt ungefär som vi äldre ser på lingonplockning och svampplockning på 
every single political party in Sweden suddenly started to have a realistic take on file sharing. Quite suddenly realized that uh, file sharers are also voters. Most parties said things that were actually quite very positive towards file sharing, but at the same time they couldn't say like, okay, we take away the copyright laws. The whole thing is far from ended. It will go on for probably several years in Sweden. Obviously just shot themselves in the foot, because now for it, it will be politically impossible for them to, to take, take an action against the Pirate Bay or something similar in Sweden again. It was quite an eye-opener for them that there's such a, such a large uh, base of popular support for, for file sharing and the, the general copyright issues. Now the site is virtually impossible to take down because we have implemented the redundancy everywhere. So if something goes down now, like for instance a new raid or something, we're going to be back up in a couple of hours instead of a couple of days. Piratbing was born from a very loose group of people communicating on the IRC chat channels. We were basically into doing different kinds of playful internet projects and uh, reappropriating the term of Piratbirun by cutting away the anti uh, was one of those like playful impulses. So we just did it. And, uh, People had very different backgrounds. It was a very loose group. Everyone felt that this was something new and unexplored, but at the same time something that we knew would definitely grow in importance for several years ahead. What they did was to turn the public debate and actually give public opinion a counterpoint. Where there had only been the copyright industry's point of view before, there was now a counterpoint. So when the copyright industry had their voice in, in the public media, there was also the Pirate Bureau's voice, always. And I mean, that was unthinkable just five years ago. As for Piot, maybe it represents some kind of new, new wave of criticism against copyright law, when like the first wave was, was more legalistic, more based on American universities, in fact. Many people think we have like an office and uh, staff and such things, but we don't. We don't have a, a fixed location. Uh, well, we wanted to like cover the news, uh, be a practical help for people that didn't know how to do it, because there was no there was no site in Sweden explaining how it's done. It was spread by on the street, like from person to person. How do you do this? So we. We basically, we copied, I copied uh, a lot of guides from a, from a Swedish biggest internet magazine, like wrote them off. That was the start. The Pirate Bay has never been a core activity of Piot Uh As soon as the Pirate Bay got an, like, an important tracker, it was like cut off from Piot Bion so that we could go on with our core activities while the people who like to run a BitTorrent tracker did that on their own. Because that's, I mean, our basic principle is not about building empires, but branching off and, and, and uh, create a multiplicity of projects. Many international watchers are a bit astonished about how we, instead of uh, taking a very defensive approach, are taking the offensive without being aggressively in, in that way, but using the, the term pirate signals something that many people didn't think was possible at all. If you buy bootleg videos or download illegal copies from the internet, how are the people who bring you the movies supposed to pay for my glasses, get health insurance, and pay off my student loans? Because the movies we love are the work of hundreds of people, not just the actors you see on screen. Or directors, but cameramen, script supervisors, fire safety officers, costumers, and countless others. Yeah! 
your support. We'll all keep on working. I don't think that's the whole truth because I don't think they would earn much more money uh, without people downloading. Just, just trying to keep on making money by selling small plastic discs with, uh, with information on them is, is obviously something that won't last. But they have to find new ways. So there were like hundreds of really creative people and they, if they think like, they can find out new ways. It's not my job. It's not going to happen tomorrow, of course. So I really hope to just, and it will, the society and all the, uh, the stuff around them, the music industry and the bands and everything, it will, will change. So, you know, it will be different, I think. And I don't think there's going to be, uh, you know, producers and PR people. And then the next day it's going to be everybody downloads. No one gets, uh, no one gets paid and all the musicians, you know, will die and start to death and so on. Uh, a lot of what the major media companies do today are so, so obviously based around the copyright, the copyright model. I mean, uh, in, in the U.S., you speak about the tent, tentpole model. You fi find a you find a, sp a space of intellectual property that's, that ha hasn't yet been claimed, and you you put you you put your tent tentpole down and raise a whole tent up around it. Like for example, if you make a movie, you also sell plastic toys and 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 such, which kind of make up makes up the tent. And, and obviously, that that sort of model is, uh, would be impossible with. Uh, with a different intellectual property climate. They have managed to adapt historically when the first, first tape recorders came. Oh no, people will be able to copyright music yeah. and, and such. So, uh, and when the, the first video recorders came, it was the same. Oh no, people, people will copy our, copy our property and we won't make any money, but obviously they, they were able to adapt to that also. It's analogous to the complaint that was made against uh, the video cassette recorder 20 years ago, 30 years ago, when the industry did exactly the same crybaby act and said, you know, people recording films off television is going to put us out of business. Well, it didn't. It actually created another revenue stream, and they were able to sell video cassettes at the same time as people taped off air. And in the end, they were, the studios were proved wrong in the courts, and the courts decided against them. But 30 years ago, the, court, the courts were much more pro-consumer. Now they're much more pro-corporate. I think that uh, the music we see on uh, MTV and these music channels, that kind of music will disappear, more or less. And I don't care because I don't even like it. And we will have uh, music which is more for the listeners and not just for people to make money on it, you know, 25 million dollars per album, it's, I think it's absurd. I don't want to, I don't want to give money to them, I think it's so wrong, it would just, it would be, it's against my moral and my ethics. I think that the law is going to be rewritten as the technology insists that it is, you know, it's not a question of right or wrong anymore. Um, people will do what they want to do in, in order to, uh, get what they want all the you know, what's the line about every behind every great fortune lies a great crime so the guys who started this business all cheated somebody to get there and so now they're being cheated perhaps uh, file sharing is not a problem it's an opportunity there's a Chinese proverb saying that when the winds of change are blowing some people are building shelters and others are building windmills it's interesting in historical perspective that up to the 70s, recorded music was rather seen as a threat against musicians by, for example, musicians' unions and collecting societies. Instead, it was totally obvious to them that live performances was and remained the main revenue stream for musical performers. Then, after the cassette tape explosion, there was some kind of capitul capitulation to recorded music. And it, and it was a golden age for the uh, for recording industry with the CD. But if we look backwards today, that rather looks like a historical parenthesis. And I would say that live performances are again 
turning to, to be the, the main revenue stream for musicians, most musicians. It's one of the great ironies that our enemy in this is our consumer and one of the rules that anybody in marketing knows is not make an enemy of your customer. Uh, we have no choice because uh, frankly, when the music is being consumed for free, they're no longer customers that we can look after, um, nor customers that we want. It is ridiculous to believe that you can give product away for free and be more successful. I mean, it defies the laws of nature. Would, would a clothing store sell, give all their clothes for free? A car dealership give all their clothes, cars for free? Of course not. Now, it doesn't mean you don't do some promotions and you don't use advertising creatively, but nobody can make, a, a, if they don't make a profit in this world, they're out of business. That's just the laws of human nature. Matrix is a system, Neil. That system is our enemy. But when you're inside, you look around, what do you see? Businessmen, teachers, lawyers, carpenters, the very minds of the people we are trying to save. But until we do, these people are still a part of that system, and that makes them our enemy. You have to understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. And many of them are so inert, so hopelessly dependent on the system, that they will fight to protect it. Were you listening to me, Neo? Or were you looking at the woman in the red dress? I was... Look again. Freeze it. If you are not one of us, you are one of them. What are they? They are guarding all the doors, they are holding all the keys, but they will never be as strong or as fast as you can be. Politicians can never stop the file sharing movement. movement. It's always going to be about the young people doing what they want. If they don't uh, think the laws are worth obeying, they won't obey them. I don't think that uh, the American government or, or anybody else can, can stop like, uh, uh, what's, what's happening on the internet uh, when it comes to downloading files. They maybe in the short run they can make uh, some small uh, like, uh, ways to like, uh, fight uh, Pirate Bay, but I think in the long run the they cannot control it. The internet, it's too big, you can't fight against it. Mm -hmm. It uh, will always be possible to, <laughs> to share and download. I don't think you, no one can stop it. <laughs> it's new technique, <clears throat> and I think uh, people will find ways to use it anyway. The technology is always evolving, so uh, the lobbyists will have a hard time to catch up with the vultures. So I think they will always be one step behind. I don't even believe they're not police state crap that they will get through with it. People will always try to share ideas and share files. I think file sharing will last forever.
we are not interested in compromises with, with this. We are interested in new things, not old solutions, that is, compromises. For, for quite long now, been been involved in uh, freedom of speech issues, and this is a direct uh, extension of that. So as personal, I see the Pirate Bay as a sort of organized uh, civil disobedience uh, to, to simply force a change of the, the current copyright laws and the, the general copyright climate. The Pirate Bay is very fun. It's a technical challenge to run it. And I really don't care much about people telling me what I can and can't do.